Well, good morning, good morning, everyone. My name is John Fanus. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm privileged to introduce our guest speaker this morning. We've been in a series called Faith Seeking Understanding. The whole idea that, that part of our love for God is to love God with our, our whole mind as well. To have a faith that, uh, as best as we can, has a reason behind it so that we understand what we believe and we're able to explain to others. Our guest today is David Nystrom. He's not a stranger to many of us. He uh, was one of our first college ministers back in the day, in the early days of our church. Uh, he's now a professor at Western Seminary. And when you just join me in giving him a round of applause as he comes up right now to join us. So I want you guys to know I love this guy. He's, he's the real deal in person, too. So let me pray for him, and uh, we'll hear from him. God, thank you so much for Dave joining us this morning. Open our minds and our hearts to you. We pray our faith would be more deeply rooted. We would love you more and be able to share about you more as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for letting me. Okay, that was very affirming. That was awesome. <laughs> So, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, you're in, you're in this series, Faith Seeking Understanding, and the topic I was given was, is the Bible the Word of God, or how reliable is the Bible? This is actually kind of important, right? Because uh, we, we believe the, the Bible is the Word of God, that God speaks through it, that uh, it's, all, it's for our mind, but it's also for our heart. Um, so, a little formula that I think is, aptly captures the Christian life. Following Jesus learns, learn, means learning from him attitudes of heart and of mind and of uh, patterns of heart, I'm sorry, patterns of heart and of mind and of action. So it's not just what you think, but learning how to think in a Christian way. Not just what to feel, but that whole process of the interaction of your mind with your heart and then those things together shaping how you live. So that's that whole integrated person. And so understanding scripture is pretty vital to that. So next slide. So uh, here's my plan. You know, things don't always go according to plan. Uh, but that's my plan for this morning. So a little bit of a prelude on uh, Isaiah 55, 11. Spend a, just a few minutes talking about our context for truth. Because we have a, today there are actually three different, uh, very different uh, understandings of how truth functions and what it is, all operating at the same time. So just uh, fleshing that out a little, making that clear for us. And then a uh, couple of questions. Four, is the, is the text of the Bible accurate? Because you hear people say, I hear people say this on, on TV, uh, Bill Maher says it quite a lot. Um, yeah, boy, the Bible's been changed so much over the years. Who can tell what it, you know, what it really said originally? So let's ask that question. Is the text accurate? Uh, and then, is the Bible historically accurate? Does the Bible just play fast and loose with history, or, or is there actually evidence to suggest that the people who wrote it actually knew what they were talking about, and there, it can be lodged in certain events? Uh, thirdly, or Roman numeral four, uh, has the theology been changed? You hear that too. Oh, the early Christians just thought Jesus was a nice guy, and then pretty quickly uh, they developed this idea, or maybe centuries later, that he was somehow God. So has the theology been changed? And then finally, is the Bible accurate to life? So that's my plan. Okay, that's great, yeah. So next slide. So prelude, next slide. So this is Isaiah 55, 11. The word which goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but shall accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That's a really interesting idea. This is God speaking. I don't know how often you think about words, uh, uh, but words are really pretty important. And uh, here God says, I'm the one whose words always accomplish what I intend them to do. So next slide. So uh, this guy, uh, typical geeky academic uh, looking person, uh, and his book, How to Do Things with Words, a brilliant analysis, uh, really one of the first ones about what we now call <clears throat> speech acts. And what he said is there are certain words that are performatives. So this church is University Covenant, that's its name. Sometime decades ago, a bunch of people got together and they said, we're going to have a church and we're going to call it University Covenant. No one has ever called this church Beulah Presbyterian. 
right? It's always been University Covenant. This is Larry Mercer, my friend Larry here. Somebody, his parents said, he shall be called Larry. No one's ever called him uh, Sebastian. So those words actually do something. Whereas, now next slide, human words, the Bible says, sometimes our words fall to the ground. You and I have an agreement. We're going to meet for coffee on Wednesday. On my way there, I get car trouble. I don't show up. I intended to be there, so my words started out flying above the ground, but I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to complete what I promised to do. So those words fell to the ground. Sometimes we just flat out lie. Let's meet for coffee on Wednesday, I say. You say, great. Where shall we meet? Pete's, obviously. But the whole time I know I'm leaving town, I'm going to Hawaii on Monday. <laughs> so I'm just flat out lying. So sometimes our words don't even stand up. So this is really interesting. The Bible is right there. God is saying, wow, I'm the one who actually can be trusted. Par excellence. Next slide. So we're going to do just a little bit of even how we understand words. We, re, we read Scripture. We need to be thoughtful a little bit about how, we, about how we actually come to understanding words and what people are trying to express. So meaning, this very simply, is composed of sense and referent. Sense is what you're saying. Referent is what you're saying it about. So there's a very simple English sentence. Six words, seven syllables. I'm mad about my flat. If you're an American, you're upset. That's the sense because your car is stuck on the side of the road because you got a flat tire. So what you're saying it about is the flat tire. But if you live in London, you're super happy about your new apartment. Yes. <laughs> I'm mad as well, I'm just giddy, I'm crazy happy, and my flat is my apartment. So here's the same language, the same simple sentence, and yet they mean two very different things. So, wow, yeah, that, that's, we ought to, be, we ought to understand sense and reference. Next slide. Uh, but there's also this, this difference between denotation, which is the dictionary definition, and connotation, which are associated meanings. And sometimes we'll bring a connotation in when it doesn't fit. So example, the origin of a river and the beginning of that river may be the same thing. But that doesn't mean that the, that the word origin and the word beginning are exactly alike. Next slide. The beginning of a book is the opening line. But the origin of the book is the idea in the mind of the author. So if we, bring, if we bring into a new sentence that those two words are exactly the same, we can do damage. And we sometimes do that when we read the Bible and we bring into the Bible word associations from our own culture and we, without even knowing it maybe, we're imposing it on Scripture. So, for instance, another example is the capstone at the top of a building may be the most prominent part. But that doesn't mean that the word prominent also always means the thing at the top. So, next slide. The most prominent part of a tree might be a crazy-looking limb, you know, halfway up. Next slide. But then there's also this notion of imagery, right? There's Bible uses imagery a lot, simile and metaphor. And imagery depends on degree of correspondence. So we call God Father in the Bible, and that's high correspondence. We even sing praise songs. You're a good, good father. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Next slide. But Hosea calls God a runny, pussy sore. I haven't heard any praise songs to, you know, that. <laughs> All right, because that's low correspondence. And so we need to, you know, when we're reading imagery, we need to have to think about, it. is this high or low? So next slide, you can see that all this is about authorial intent. What is the author, what is the Bible trying to express? Next slide. And maybe the best example of this from literature is, uh, is this book, Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. So he wrote Alice in Wonderland, then he wrote Through the Looking Glass. In chapter six of Through the Looking Glass, Alice meets Humpty Dumpty. And that chapter's going to end with Humpty Dumpty falling down and broken, being broken into pieces. But they have this conversation. And Humpty Dumpty uses the word glory in a way that Alice, with which she's unfamiliar. And Alice says, what do you mean by glory? And Humpty Dumpty says rather proudly, I mean, there is a nice knockdown argument. And Alice goes, what? That, that's not what glory means. 
And Humpty Dumpty says, when I use a word, I mean, it means exactly what I want it to mean. Neither more nor less. <laughs> Alice says, the question is whether you can make words mean so many different things. And Humpty Dumpty says, no. The question is, who's to be the master? That's all. Right? That's, in, that's authorial intent. So when I was a high school youth pastor back in the 80s, a cool word that the high school kids used was killer. That means something's good. Killer. My mother never liked that. You know, you know why do they call that? That's dangerous. That's, that's violent, you know. She failed to understand authorial intent. Next slide. So that means we need to be aware of, next slide, well, the different understandings of truth in our culture. And you probably, you know this already. I just want to highlight it. Next slide. So uh, I grew up in the just the facts, ma'am, uh, dragnet culture. Right? Don't tell, ju just tell me what happened. I don't want to know how you feel about it. I don't know about what you think it means. Just tell me the facts. So this is kind of the modernist, like, like experiment. You know, here's what the experiment yields. Here's the data at the end. Just tell me the facts. Next slide. But, uh, and this is the classic modernist building, the Seagram's building in New York. Just look at that. I mean, it, it's, it's ex, it, it, immediately self-explanatory. You can see how it's built. You can see the foundation. You can see what holds it up. Everything about it is clear. Next slide. This is, the, this is a great postmodernist building. Next slide. The Disney Theater. Like, look at that. <laughs> like, where's the door? You know, I mean, that's... <laughs> Like, and that, that's a theater. Like, where's the screen anyway? I mean, like, that's so confusing. <laughs> right, and that's intentional because the postmodernist idea is your truth may be true for you, but it may not be true for me. Now, that, that, that means authorial intent doesn't really matter anymore. Next slide. And this really started in 1967 uh, with, this, with a famous essay called The Death of the Author. Wow. So what the author writes doesn't matter. So that idea is operative in our culture. But that isn't the path to understanding Scripture. And then recently, let's back up one, then recently, right, now truth is just being manipulated. So we have those three very different ideas of what truth is all at the same time. It's like, you're, you're sitting around the kitchen table and there's a board game and, and you're playing Monopoly, but the person next to you is playing Sorry. And the person next to you is playing something else. You're all playing a different game. So that can make it very confusing. Next slide. So then another question is, is the text accurate? Next slide. So uh, just a little bit of um, background here. The, our word Bible comes from the Greek biblion, which means book. The singular... I mean, the plural is, in Greek is biblia, and that just also happens to be the word that is Latin for the singular. So Bible means book. But uh, maybe what we ought to say is actually text, because, of course, uh, when the Old Testament was written, they didn't have books, they had scrolls. So that'd be a sefer, Hebrew is sefer for scroll. So we have, um, so we say the Bible is one book, composed of 66 separate documents that we also call books, which was a little confusing to me as a Sunday school kid. Next slide. So it's composed of two sections, what we call the Old Testament, 39 books, the New Testament, 27. Now, there are also a set of books, if you have seen a Catholic Bible, there's maybe 13, maybe 15 documents, it depends on how, how you arrange them, that are called the Apocrypha that are in the middle. Now, those are ancient Jewish documents, um, and part of the reason there's a difference is by the time Christianity was maybe 100 years old and it was clear it wasn't just a, a splinter group in Judaism, it was a separate religion, the Jews still had not yet decided what their official canon, what their official holy scriptures would be. So that's why there's a difference between Protestant and Catholic Bibles. Next slide. The Bible contains various kinds of literature. There are legal texts. There are examples of poetry. And there are narrative texts. And we interpret legal texts differently than we do poetry. They, 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 they're just, they're just, they operate differently. Next slide. Now, you may know that th this is, the, this is the, word, the, Jew, the word for, a Hebrew word for the Jewish 
scripture, Tanakh. T, Torah, the first five books. N, Naviim, which is the word for prophets. And then Kethuvim, writings, everything else. So you might even see it as capital T, capital N, capital K. And then they just take the first, out, the first vowel, A, and insert it between the consonants. That's how you get Tanakh. Next slide. So when was it written? And what about the earliest manuscripts? Next slide. So until uh, about 60 years ago, this was the oldest surviving complete Hebrew Bible. The Aleppo Codex, which means, Codex means book form, from 900 AD. So that's, that's, you know, that's over 1,000 years. That's 2,000 years almost from King David. That's a long time. Next slide. Uh, but in 1945, a discovery was made at, at a site called Qumran near the Dead Sea. That's a map you can see. It's in the northern uh, edge of the Dead Sea. Next slide. So that's a cave there where this discovery was made. And uh, 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 the story is the shepherd was looking for his goats. They were, they thought maybe they were in some of these caves. Threw a rock in, heard a jar break, went inside, and what was actually discovered were uh, hundreds and thousands and thousands of scrolls that date from about 200 to 100 B.C. And every single book virtually in the old, what we call the Old Testament, plus tons of other documents were found there. Next slide. So here's a close-up of that cave. Next slide. Other. That, that is so, it's so arid there, it makes, it makes uh, Death Valley look like the Garden of Eden. It's, it's just <laughs> incredible. Next slide. So that, uh, next slide. So the, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's part of the Isaiah scroll that was found there. Next slide. A little bit more. Next slide. And that's, one of the, that's actually a reconstruction of one of the jars. You can see where it's broken. Next slide. So Isaiah scroll. And that's the uh, up, a close-up of that Aleppo Codex. So why is all this important? Because it, 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 it immediately pushed back our earliest documents, complete documents of what we call the Old Testament, uh, more than a thousand years. And the critical issue is when those two were compared, there were virtually no changes between that one from 120 to 200 BC and the one from 900. Bottom line, what we call the Old Testament, we can have extreme confidence it has been accurately uh, passed on from the original. Next slide. So this is the earliest, pretty much the earliest uh, bit of the New Testament. There's been a recent discovery of a little bit of the Gospel of Mark that some people think might be a bit earlier, but this is certain, this is Gospel of John, it's about the size of a business card. So not real big. Dated about 120. It's a little bit of, of, the, of John's Gospel. Next slide. So this is uh, now from 180. So 60 years later, the so-called Chester Beatty Papyrus, and it's got mo much of the Corinthian letters plus uh, big chunks of Matthew and Luke. So 60 years later, now we've got like pages and pages. Next slide. Here's the Bodmer papyrus from 200, and it's basically the entire Gospel of John. The one story that's missing is the story of the woman caught in adultery, chapter 7, 53 through 8, 11. So if you look in your Bible, probably it'll have it in italics, or sometimes it'll have that section out like in the footnotes. And it'll say the earliest manuscripts don't have it. Well, everything else in John's Gospel is there. It's just that one story. Next slide. So from the 4th century, this, is, this was a, a, in book form, found, and you can see Sinaiticus, it was found in the monastery of St. Catherine below Mount Sinai. It, it's, it, it's the entire Old Testament in Greek from the 4th century. So that's close. That's just 300 years, 250 years from, the, from Jesus. Next slide. So that's another one. This is from the Vatican. Next slide. So by comparison, the earliest documents, manuscripts, complete manuscripts of Julius Caesar date from the 9th to 12th centuries. So that's 1,000 years away. So the earliest complete documents of the New Testament, only about 200 years. That's wacky closer. The earliest complete documents of Plato, 800 to, 1, to about 800. So that's 1,100 years from when Plato wrote. So it's not only that, next slide, this is going to be hard to, re I, uh, hard to see, I know, but I'll try to explain it to you. The far right red column 
So the number of manuscripts for, about the New Testament from the ancient world from before 500 that we have is uh, over 5,100. The number of manuscripts we have of, let's say, Plato is less than 30. The next highest after the New Testament is Homer, a little over 600. So the number of New Testaments is, is even that. It's like nine times more. So what does this mean? This means that all those documents compared, then we can move back and say, what is the original? That's like just having more data. Right? If you had data on only six California cities, how accurate would your evaluation, your estimate of California be, as opposed to 600? Does that make sense? So the bottom line is, way more than any other author, any other collection from the ancient world, way more you can trust the Bible to be accurate to what the original authors wrote. Does that make sense? Way more. And no one ever questions, oh, we only have six manuscripts from Plato, so how do we know what the original was? No one ever questions that. So in terms of accuracy, confidence, way higher for the Bible than anything else from the ancient world. Next slide. So there's also this question of how then, oh, we don't have time for that. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Yeah, I already said something like that. Yeah, next slide. Next slide. So, um, you know, Latin was the language of the Roman Empire. And so what happened is the originals of the New Testament were written in Greek. But after about 300, people spoke Latin, and this guy Jerome translated the Bible from Greek and Hebrew into Latin. And that became the basic Bible for, for a thousand years. But after the Renaissance, you know, the Renaissance people are trying to like recover the ancient world. Some people, like next slide, this guy Erasmus, he was the one who actually went out and found early Greek manuscripts. And they were like on the back, they were on the back of like people had flipped them over and, and written muffin recipes on the, you know, on the <laughs> other side. So he found them all over the place. And he, and he found a number of manuscripts, a couple hundred, and then he created, he sort of worked backward and recreated what he thought would be the original New Testament in Greek. Next slide. That's what it looks like. You can see the date, 1516, the first one. And if that strikes a bell, 1517 is when Luther put, posts the 95 Theses on the, on the church door. Next slide. So it's that Greek New Testament that Erasmus put together that Luther used to translate the, the, the Bible into German. Not Latin, but this time from the original Greek. Since then, next slide, we, the, uh, thousands more manuscripts have been discovered. That's when we get to the 5,170. So all that to say, and this guy Bruce Metzger is the one who knows more about this than anyone who's ever lived. He, he, if you have a Bible and it says, here's the people that are on the translation committee, he's always the chair of everything. <laughs> so uh, here, and here, here, doesn't he look like a nice man? like Grandpa Bruce Metzger. Um, so, but the basic, the basic bottom line is, like I said, not, about 99.99999% certainty. What you've got in your Bible is what was originally written. I think that's pretty awesome. How about you? Yeah, okay, that's good. Okay, next slide. So is text historically accurate? Well, I think we can say yes. So uh, here's just a couple examples. Um, uh, until pretty recently, uh, secular scholars or just people who weren't Christians or were, people just were interested would say, you know, there's no evidence for King David outside the Bible itself. There really wasn't. You don't have, you don't have other letters from other kings saying, how's it going, bro, you know, anything like that. <laughs> but uh, maybe about t 10 or 15 years ago, actually, a, an incidental, like a trade document, sort of like you know, tariffs and stuff like that back and forth was, uh, was discovered that just happens to mention King David incidentally. So there's evidence outside the Bible itself that some guy named David actually existed. There's also the famous case of Quirinius, the governor. So this is Luke 2, 1 and following. So this census, right about G but, but when Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph go to, go to uh, Bethlehem for the census. And the way the text is usually translated is, was the first that took place after Quirinius was governor. 
Problem is, Quirinius didn't become governor until 6 AD. And we don't really know of a census. So what's that about? It's too late, and what census is it? Um, but uh, here's a book you might want to look at, although it's, it, 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 yeah, it, just, it doesn't look, there's no pictures <laughs> or anything. But it is, it's, it's very recent. It's by a guy named Craig Blomberg, The Historical Reliability of the New Testament, if you're interested in this. And he points out that um, the language, the, fra the phraseology that Luke uses can also mean before, like before Quirinius was governor. And then he points out from secular literature a whole bunch of cases where that's exactly right. So it wasn't that the text has been wrong, it's that we, as we have read it, we've misunderstood the intent of the author up until now. Does that make sense? Next slide. Uh, the Gospels, I mean, they're not really histories, right? The Gospels have, they tell the story of Jesus' birth, two of them, and then nothing. Except for Luke, there's that one episode when Jesus is 12, but then nothing until he's an adult. So they're not really biographies. But actually, in the ancient world, they didn't have biographies the way we understand them. <coughs> what they did was, like Plutarch's lives, I think that maybe is the, next, the last slide, Plutarch tells, these story, uh, tells stories about, or, or, or has this uh, form of literature about famous people, and they are exactly the way the Gospels are organized. A little bit about their birth, and then several things about their adult life and why they're significant. So what would be weird is if the Gospels were actually biographies like we understand them. So they fit the pattern. And it also point, and I'd also point out, you know, history, narrative history, sometimes uses expressive language, right? The spies come back and say, dude, their cities are, from the, they go to the promised land, the spies come back and say, wow, their cities are large with walls up to the sky. Well, they weren't really up to the sky, you know? But I, I, had, I had the best coffee ever this morning. <laughs> well, not really. You know, not really science. I mean, we use that language all the time. We, oh, we, we speak by hyperbole. So that doesn't mean it's wrong. We just need to understand that's the kind of language it is. Next slide. So uh, this guy, obviously you can see his name, Sir William Ramsey. He was a Nor Nobel Prize winning chemist. You can see his dates. He died over 100 years ago. Uh, after he won, I think it was after he won his Nobel Prize. He was in Asia Minor. And uh, it's unclear really what, what his purpose was in being there. Some people say that he wasn't a Christian and was trying to disprove early Christianity. Um, but, when he, when he, uh, but he encountered passages like, um, you might remember this, they're speaking in the, what, from them, Paul's there in Asia Minor, and it says, talking about the, the people he's with, they're speaking in the Lyconian language. Very odd, minor, local dialect. And historians have always said, well, that's wrong because the boundary between Lyconia and Pamphylia was in a different place. It just so happened, I mean, Ramsey was there and, and through ar archaeological discovery, et cetera, un found out that actually, no, the boundary was changed a few years later. So it would be actually historically accurate to say Lyconian language in that spot. And in fact, because um, it, uh, it always seemed like a problem for people. They've got them speaking the Laconian language in a province that isn't Laconia. So all kinds of things like that, Ramsey, uh, that, were, that were 100 years ago, people thought were problems relative to Christianity, he proved weren't. Next slide. There's also this question of this guy, Erastus, who in, in Corinth is the city manager. Now, Erastus is the capital of the Roman province of, I mean, uh, Corinth is the capital of the Roman province of Achaia. And so there's some guy that, that, that we're actually supposed to believe there's some guy named Erastus who becomes a Christian. People thought this was false for many, many, many years until an inscription was found in 1926 that, made, that names a guy named Erastus as the city manager. Same thing with this Licinius, the Tetrarch of Abilene. People said, oh no, they're, they're, Abilene wasn't a Tetrarchy. But then uh, about 75 years ago, uh, a, a, a discovery was made uh, uh, the, of a text that actually mentioned Licinius as the Tetrarch of Abilene. So all kinds of stuff is happening that is verifying uh, many of the points that people have questioned about the historical accuracy of Scripture. Does that make sense? Next slide. But there's also this question, right? So Paul writes this. It, it, we believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, that he was crucified, dead, and buried, and that he was raised from the dead. 
And Paul says if we don't believe that, I mean, if that didn't happen, then those of us who believe it are the most to be pitied. It isn't just a great story. If it isn't true, those of us who believe it are being deluded. And Paul says, this happened. So this is an objective historical fact. It happened. Now people will say, um, how in the world could that be? We don't see people resurrected every day. Or ever. So uh, in the middle, really for most of the 20th century, a lot of Christian theologians didn't even want to touch this. Next slide. But this guy did. Wolfhard Pannenberg, I think maybe he just passed away. Um, he wrote a book in the 60s called Jesus, God, and Man, in which he addressed this directly. The, the, cruci- the resurrection has to be historically true, or those of us who are believers, it, you were, just, we're just being deluded. And so he asked a couple of really good uh, historical questions. Uh, um, number one, um, what would it take if you were a Jew in the first century to get yourself crucified? What would you have to do? <laughs> what would you have to claim about yourself to get yourself crucified? And not only that, but um, we know of a number of other Messiah figures from the first century who were caught and then executed. And after they were dead, their followers followed somebody else. The case of Jesus is the only one in which we know that the followers of a crucified Messiah continue to follow him after his death. How do you explain that? So there are... There are, so even from, a, from the canons of history, because history doesn't like things that are unique, there has to be an explanation. What could the explanation possibly be? And so, as crazy as it sounds to the world around us, that Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried, and that God raised him from the dead makes historical sense. If it weren't for the fact that history says miracles don't happen. But of course, if you believe in God, then miracles happen. My wife married me. Miracles <laughs> happen. Next slide. So has the, has the theology been messed with? You, I, hear that, I hear this a lot. Um, next slide. So I took this photo of my Greek New Testament uh, a couple days ago. Next slide. Uh, same page. So above the line is the actual Greek text. Below the line is, the, see that complex, all that stuff? So what's below the line is, the text is actually saying, here are all the variants, here are all the other possible readings. So nobody's hiding anything. Everything is right there. And if you look at verse 13, about halfway up, or two-thirds of the way up the screen, so the Greek there says, no one has gone into heaven except the one who came down from heaven. Heaven is Uranus, or some form of Uranus. Um, the son of man. And then if you look down below the line, verse 13, it says C. So they give, the the, the critics give the text four different ratings. A means we're dead sure this is what it says. Anytime there's any variation, even the tiniest one, and most of them, the vast majority are are like uh, spelling problems or or, or they'll do things like, uh, like we sometimes do, like we write the word the twice in a row. So it's stuff like that. So this is a C rating. A is, the, a is we're dead sure, B is we're really sure, C is we, yeah, we're pretty sure, D is, hmm, could, could be the other way. So all the other readings are there. So you see all the other, it says C, anthropu, that means this is the reading, and all the texts that have this reading are listed there. So Sinaiticus, et cetera. All those, those are all families of texts and different manuscripts. And then two lines below the 13, that's down, uh, down below the line, you'll see double black backslash, and then it adds the words in Greek, who is in heaven. So that's the variant. No one has ever uh, gone into heaven except the one who's come down from heaven, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And that will then tell you all the places where that, all the text where that variant is there. So number one, everything is clear, no one's hiding anything. Uh, number two, that doesn't really change the theology any. Jesus is the one who, even while he's on earth, has perfect view of God in heaven, right? I do only what I see the Father doing, and everything the Father does that the Son does. 
So if that was a change, you could see how it doesn't change the theology. Next slide. So here are the three major, three huge uh, variants. Number one, John, uh, the woman cut in the adultery. We've talked about that already. Number two, the long ending of Mark. Mark, uh, in the earliest manuscripts, ends at 16.9. So it doesn't have a story of people going to the tomb. In some of the later manuscripts, that's added, and you can kind of understand that, that people thought, well, maybe this is maybe good intention. People thought maybe something's, something's missing here. But they didn't invent crazy stories, you know, of Batman being at the tomb also, you know, or something like that. It's, it's modeled on uh, the other canonical gospels. And then there's this variant in 1 John 5. Let's see the next slide. So here's the variant, for there are three that testify in heaven, the Father, the Word, etc. So all the things that are, in, that are in italics appeared after about 1500. This is very late, 1500, in one small collection of Bibles in Britain. And you can see that the bottom is the original. So just think about that. That's one of the three most important ones, and, it, and the change was made in 1600 or 1500. And you can see it doesn't really change the theology. Next slide. So the bottom line is none of these variants change a core doctrine of the faith in the least. We can trust the scriptures. Next slide. What was there from the beginning is this idea. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So this is Paul's hymn to Christ. So Paul, very early on, asserts that Jesus is somehow God. Next slide. As does James, very early. And he, say, he, calls God, he calls Jesus our glorious Lord. Really? You're Jewish and you use the word glory and apply it to someone? You apply it to God. And he even then calls him Lord, our glorious Lord. So it's clear James had, believes that somehow this person, Jesus, that who he knew is also God. Next slide. So then the question is, is the Bible accurate to life? Next slide. So Thucydides wrote his history of the Peloponnesian War, and he said, I'm going to write this because I'm going to tell you a little bit about human nature. Okay, next slide. So Jacob has two wives, Leah and Rachel, even though you're not supposed to be polygamous. Yeah, well, that's us, right? <laughs> we don't always do what we're supposed to do. And curiously, each one of the wives wants what the other one has. Huh, is that true to life? <laughs> right, we get something and like we like it for the first two weeks and then three weeks later, we all of a sudden start realizing now we want a new one. We don't have, we, we aren't very satisfied. Next slide, next slide. Yeah, I'm gonna move forward next. So the basic idea of the Bible is we are broken and we cannot fix ourselves. And God has sent his son to earth to suffer and die and to be raised from the dead so that we can be reunited to God the way God intended. And Livy here says, we are broken and we cannot fix ourselves. So I'd like to suggest to you that the scriptures are accurate and trustworthy, and that in them are the words of life. Father God, we thank you for your love for us, for your patience with us, and for the fact that your son Jesus came to earth in ways we could understand. He modeled compassion, he modeled truth, and he modeled a heart after yours. We thank you for your scriptures. May they live in our hearts. Amen.